Welcome back to more of Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped. Last time we cleared two more Egyptian levels and got ourselves another coloured gem. In fact, if you look here, we only have one more coloured gem left. But we have three levels left in this warp room, and uh, I haven't even really gone into who the boss is, but that portrait should be familiar to you if you've um, played Crash 2. So the next one we'll be taking on is a really interesting one, Bye Bye Blimps. This is going to be a bit of a weird part in general because we have two vehicle levels plus a level that we cannot get the box gem on on our first pass. But Bye Bye Blimps, something about this that I didn't actually know until kind of recently. See how uh, the icon's down there? Crash's icon is still there. But if I go to Tell No Tales, his icon is crossed out. In the original version of this game, this was a Coco only level, but it's actually not anymore. Crash can do it now, but I'm gonna play it as Coco because, you know, gonna respect the original. So, Crash Bandicoot will meet again. Uka Uka and Dr. Cortex want me to teach you a lesson. Well... I made a few modifications to my mechanics since our last encounter. <laughs> so back off or be deleted! Yep, Engine is back. And I love that wave there. This is a very interesting type of level, where in a plane and, um, yeah, you actually have to use Z off the machine gun and you can press the jump button to do a barrel roll. Or, uh, the slide button, I think, um, L or R as well. Yeah, uh, the, um, I was about to say R2, but yeah, that, um, that also does the break. You will need to know about the breaks for a later plane level. But yeah, our goal here is to destroy all of Cortex's blimps. And we do have boxes here too. You can either shoot the box itself or shoot the balloon holding it up. Shooting the box itself is obviously a bit faster. And we have um, basically a constant uh, barrage of enemy fighters here. The balloons with um, the red cross icon, which I'm actually kind of surprised that they um, didn't have to change that for this version because I think Earthbound, didn't Earthbound get into trouble for using the red cross icon? I don't know, but those, those heal you. Anyway, let's see, you've got seven boxes. These levels are kind of interesting. They're a new um, mechanic that's introduced very late into the game, and these levels, I'll just say it now, are incredibly easy for the most part. So it, it feels kind of weird that they're placed so late. In fact, uh, in um, um, Wrath of Cortex, they actually put the plane levels um, very early into the game, probably, to compensate, but... Yeah, I, don't, I know not everyone is a fan of these levels, and um, I guess I can talk in general about the ve how I feel about Crash 3's um, kind of abundance of vehicle levels in this part, because we'll be encountering a few of them. One thing about these levels, though, is that they are actually kind of interesting to time trial, because you really have to plan a route when it comes to getting to all of the blimps, and figuring out a fast route. Some of the boxes are time freezes, so you'll have to take that into account as well. And the moment that you destroy the last blimp, you automatically get the crystal and leave the level. So like I said, that level is incredibly easy, at least I find it that way. As long as you don't stay in the stream of shots from the other fighters without barrel rolling, it's really not that bad. But I do feel it just shows to highlight kind of Coco's... Coco's mechanical abilities, the fact that she gets a lot of the vehicle levels, like the plane one, and in this case the jet ski one. That will be important later. So, this level's in an interesting position because it's supposed to be the second jet ski level that you visit, but depending on how many relics you've got, and whether you got a certain secret exit earlier in the game, it could actually be the fourth and last jet ski level that you visit. So, kind of weird how that works out, but this level I find is interesting because it feels slightly more non-linear than making waves. You have a lot wider uh, of an ocean to move around in, and there are parts of the level where you have multiple different ways to go, such as here. 
of course, uh, this time you have to go this way to get the boxes. So, on the one hand, the wider sea means it's easier to avoid some obstacles, but there are some new obstacles to keep you on your toes, like these Anchor Swing Pirates, which I always found to be a pretty cool enemy type. And we still have the Sneeze, as I like to call them. So, as we go through this jet ski level, I guess I can talk a little bit about something. People in the comments mentioned that, like, some people think that they messed up the jet ski controls in this version, they made them kind of slippery. Honestly, I'm, I've never really had that much of a problem with the jet ski controls in the Insane Trilogy, although then again, I haven't played the original, um, the original uh, version of these levels in a very long time. I'm gonna wait for the sneeze to get through here so that I can grab this other box safely. But speaking of the original jet ski levels, there is something I definitely remember from them. And that is that they went really overkill on the controller vibration in those levels, I, I think. Um, at least if my memory is any uh, is accurate at all. So, something that you have to remember is back when this first came out, also these sharks are a new enemy here. They have a pretty funny death animation as well. But back when this game first came out, controller vibration, or rumble in the case of the Nintendo 64, was still a relatively new concept, and Sony was really marketing the heck out of its new DualShock controllers. At the time, there were even ads for them on the back of the manual for the Crash games. And I feel that because of how new it was, they really overcompensated with the vibration on uh, in Crash 3 especially. Like, if you lost a life, the controller would vibrate to an immense degree. And in these levels, the controller was vibrating pretty intensely uh, on almost a constant basis while you were accelerating. And it made these jet ski levels almost physically painful to play, which is kind of a problem. So, one really good thing about the remake is the vibration is way less intense here. It's actually like pretty mild, it's barely even noticeable. But yeah, that's a story from my childhood when it comes to this game. Here's another one of the areas where this level's a bit non-linear. Speaking of which, there's something here that I'm just gonna splice in footage from another attempt at this level because uh, it involves lives and they're gone since I have had to restart the level. And this level has a really interesting thing to it as well. There's an area where you can actually get through these and get a set of lives in between two parts of the level. I don't think it's here, but um, I'll be sure to show that. Also, yeah, those sharks are a new enemy. Yeah, you can see the lives there. We'll be getting those later. Actually, I think this is the gap. Yeah, it is. Okay, so yeah, we can actually get through here and grab a bunch of lives, so that's pretty cool. There really isn't much we can do here, we're just kind of stopped by a lot of invisible walls, but it's just kind of a nice touch that, um, they actually let you get through, as Lloyd in, um, trails, um, of, um, Zero would say, get over the barrier, slash get through the barrier. But yeah, this little side area is pretty much entirely for boxes. But I always loved that you could actually get through that barrier a bit, um, I remember when I was a kid, I could see those lives, and I was like, oh, they're taunting me, how do I get those? I was thinking that, like, I could dive under the bobbles or something. That, combined with the, that sort of secret area of Sphinxinator, it was just like all of those crazy rumours that you used to hear about on the playground about games. I can't believe that didn't hit me. And it was actually true here. Like, you know, a bunch of lives outside of the barriers. It's just like that grass just outside of the barrier around Pallet Town in Pokemon um, Red and Blue, except, yeah, here you can actually get there. It was just really, really cool discovering that when I was younger. And of course they kept that in this version. So how close are we? Oh, we're getting pretty close to the end of this level. I was about to say here you have to get these ramps, but you can instead just go between them. Grab both of these, avoid the literal anchor man. One, two, three. Yep, that's all the boxes, so let's go ahead and make sure we grab the gem before we're heading out. There's a life there. Yeah, um, I know that my sister would chastise me if I left that alone. She's um she's what she likes to call in Mario a coin perfectionist, and uh, in this a fruit perfectionist. Just she does not like leaving little collectibles not collected. 
I've probably told this story before, but um, back when, even when she played Age of Empires, she would not like to leave any unexplored bits of the map. <laughs> anyway, that is that level completed, and we have one more in this warp room, but as I said at the start, we can't get the box gem here on our first pass, so this will be purely a crystal run. So here we are in the future! And I don't know if we can clearly see it, but yeah, with that big engine rocket sign, it seems like engine owns the future, and that's not good for us, so, um... I mean, I don't know if we're doing something about it by defeating him here, but... If we stop Cortex and company from using the Time Twister, then maybe they will uh, stop meddling with time. So these levels have a lot of very unique obstacles. They have conveyor belts, they have these lasers, they have a lot of new enemy types to them. The future levels, despite there actually being only two of them, at least in the original version of the game, they became some of the most iconic parts of Crash Bandicoot 3 among people who played them, and uh, they got referenced in some of the later installments. In particular, the, the GBA games had a very interesting take on these levels. They used a lot of the enemies from the future levels, such as these weird spy drone things that are invincible while they're shielded, by the way, and the lasers and the conveyor belts, but they combined them with elements of the Crash Bandicoot 2 space station levels, like the, um, the, um, what, what do you call them? Like the, the arm robots, the ones with the electrified arms that you can that alternate between being immune to jumping or spinning. And they also had the music of these future levels, but the overall aesthetic of the Crash 2 space level, which is kind of interesting. Speaking of things that GBA games did, um, oh, by the way, yeah, these, are uh, flying saucer lab assistants are new. And, okay, one, one slight complaint I have against the Insane Trilogy, in the original game, these red and, uh, green, green and red platforms used to make this really funny whoop 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 woo sound whenever they were about to flip over, but they don't make as, as anywhere near of a memorable sound in this version. A thing we just passed was, um, another interesting enemy here, and another really interesting gimmick of these is these things, which if you touch them, they force you into a tornado spin. But yeah, these things, you can jump on them or spin them while they're shielded, ironically, but when they have the spikes up, no, don't touch them. Bad. But they also have a bit of an interesting behaviour when it comes to a later power-up. Actually, not so much later, we'll be getting it very soon. Okay, so something that's actually interesting, the Switch version does not have reflections off of the sides of these buildings. In uh, the PS4 and the Xbox 360 versions, you actually do have reflections here, and the lack of reflections actually required them to change the level design of uh, one of the later future levels. We'll get to that later. Yeah, these platforms were also in the space levels in uh, the GBA, well, the GBA game, they're only in, um, I haven't actually mentioned this before, but I know what the first Crash Game Boy Advance game is Crash Bandicoot XS, but it's called The Huge Adventure in, uh, America. I don't know, it's one of those weird games that has a different title in two English-speaking regions. I mean, for Advance Wars Days of Ruin, it's justified because that game was localised by completely different people in the different regions, but... Here there's... I don't know, but anyway. I always liked the way the bonus platforms looked in these future levels, and I also loved how you got a good view of um, everything. Also, the remix of the bonus theme is pretty cool here. So this bonus is pretty much about all of your power-ups. Or almost all of them, at least. And yeah, I technically don't need to do this, but I'm doing it anyway, just because... I don't know, I, I still want to play as much of the level as possible, even if we can't finish it on the first pass. And yet, here's another case of the good old spin jump, double jump, tornado spin. No, slide jump, double jump, tornado spin. I keep saying spin jump, double jump, I don't know why. But yeah, slide jump, double jump, tornado spin. But I guess the actual theme of the future levels, like the music, is also something that is very iconic. I feel like among the people who played the Crash Bandicoot games, this music always stands out. It's the song that a lot of people remember from these games. Maybe there's just something about the general, like, I don't know, like, classic Far Future aesthetic of these levels that's just kind of memorable. Like, I'm just trying to figure out, just, because there aren't that many of these levels in the game, and yet they became a really iconic part of it.
But with that, yep, we can't do anything more here. No box gym for us just yet. And just like that, we're at the boss already. So the boss of this area is the reason why I use Coco for all of the levels, because Yep, this boss is Coco only, despite Engine uh, going on about getting revenge on Crash from last time. So that means that this is the one warp room in the game where every level can be completed as Coco. So, here we go. So, <laughs> you want to go a few rounds? When this is over, we'll see who is obsolete. I didn't talk about Dr. Entropy's voice trivia because he has the same voice actor as Engine, Corey Burton. He plays a lot of characters in the Kingdom Hearts series, and he's actually kind of interesting because he's voiced two different incarnations of Zeus. He plays the God of War Zeus and the Disney Hercules Zeus from Kingdom Hearts 3. Both are radically different versions of the characters, so that's kind of interesting. But anyway. Let's talk about this actual fight. So just like in Crash 2, you need to destroy the various weak points on Engine's mech, and the weak points are where all the weapons are. So as Engine loses health, he actually gets weaker because uh, more and more of his um, of his weapons are being destroyed. This was the fight that, in a way, established Coco as basically being Engine's heroic counterpart. Which is something that Crash Team Racing would continue by making the two of them acceleration class characters. But yeah, as you can see, he's only down to one weapon, so um, yeah, the lower health he has, the easier he is. If you want to see a ridiculously hard mode version of this fight, check out Cuphead and Dr. Carl's Robot. Basically, I'd describe that as if Engine was designed by absolute sadists. I still actually haven't beaten that part of Cuphead. So it's over, right? Her comes back for one last ride. As you can tell, it's not over yet. Engine is back for more. This fight is really not all that hard, but it's still really, really cool looking. I like to destroy that bomb launcher at the bottom first here, because these bombs have a very big blast radius. So, um, yeah. I think you can destroy them? Yeah, there we go. These side launchers probably should go second because they do a lot of damage if they hit you. I didn't realize that the back of the capsule looks like kind of a tiger, looks like a tiger with teeth, that's kind of cool. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's one of the side pulse launchers gone. Really just keep racking up the damage and uh, you'll destroy these parts pretty quickly. Due to the reticle kind of moving as you move, you kind of have to um, adjust it quite a bit and aim like a little ahead of where you're actually moving. Also, I should mention, this boss theme is really great, especially the version from the original PlayStation 1 uh, version of the game. I recommend looking it up because you generally can't hear it over all the laser and explosion sounds, but it's a pretty cool song. For defeating Engin, we get the Fruit Bazooka, which is something entirely new to Crash 3. This makes getting the box gems on earlier levels way easier, because you can just use this to shoot any box you want. It's funny how history repeats itself. Yet again, Engin has failed to defeat you. <laughs> We must destroy you! <coughs> oh, my aching head. I'm not feeling myself these days. So, the end is in sight. Gather another five crystals, and again you will have foiled my plan. Or will you? Don't know why Crash suddenly appeared there, but yeah, overall, despite being fourth, I actually consider that probably the easiest boss in the game, but it is pretty cool. So, one more thing that I didn't get a chance to say at the time is that due to the time travel theme of this game, I actually consider that boss battle to be 
this game's counterpart to the moon landing. <laughs> I don't know if that's like ever, was ever really the intention, but that's kind of how I see it. So, as they said, the end is in sight. We only have one more warp room to go. But there's still the relics and the secret warp room and a couple of secret levels that we left in the third warp room to go. So with that, I will see you all next time for the final stretch. See you all then. Wow! Oh, that was way too close. But yeah, Vibration and Rumble were relatively new at the time, and I feel that because of that, like, like, like Sony was heavily advertising their new Dual Shock controllers, and like on the like there were ad advertisements for them on the back of the um. Oh yeah, I knew I would hit that one. So hey, look what I found. Yeah, I actually still have this. Feel the awesome vibrations of the analog controller, Dual Shock, in Crash Bandicoot's latest adventure. It works perfectly with his motorbike, and the jet ski, and the biplane. Oh, and it's Tiger compatible too. Oh god, I just remembered. Yeah, um, ha. Uh, the vibration was pretty ridiculous on those levels too.